In my previous video, I worked on adding a new feature to a small GitHub uh, open source project, and I wanted to do something a little bit different to give you some sense of the range of um, the kinds of things that can happen. So this time I wanted to do something, and um, again, I was looking for you know something that I could work on that would be similar to the kinds of things that you would do. So I looked for a good first issue. There's a Twitter account called Good First Issue that you can follow, and they often tweet whenever various projects uh, put up a good first issue. And uh, I noticed that there was one that went up for this project, Fastify. Fastify is a really interesting project. It's kind of like Express. It's a, a Node.js web framework, but it has a real emphasis on speed and TypeScript support and, um, Anyway, I've always wanted to work with it, and I thought this would be a good chance to try uh, contributing to it. So this is a much bigger project. If we um, if we go look up Fastify, this is the uh, website for it, and um, you write code that looks like this. So it. You know, you define your routes. Again, it, it feels kind of like Express in a lot of ways. Um, Built-in support for TypeScript and things like this. And the project is on, project is on GitHub, um, used by over 5,000 other repositories, more than 5,000, 8,000 repositories, 294 contributors. Um, you can see that it's like just, Looks like it was really heavily developed 2018, but then it's been constantly uh, maintained. It's been increasing, it looks like, in the last few months. So this is a really healthy open source project, uh, four years old. So I would say that this is sort of a, a medium size uh, project where the last one we did was a smaller project with only one person. This is a, a bigger project. It's not huge, uh, you know, they have 58 issues here, but if you go into the Fastify organization, they have 87 repositories. So a lot of things are implemented as plugins. And so there's lots of things in here that even if you didn't contribute to the main part of the project, you can contribute to lots of other things um, for, you know, different kinds of things like everything from documentation, like here's the Chinese version of the docs or, um, you know, things for doing JSON stringification or OAuth2 um, protocol support, stuff like that. There's all sorts of things in here that you could, you could work on. So I saw this, um, this tweet and it linked to an issue. So here's the issue. Now I started recording this yesterday and my recording software crashed on me, which sucks, but such is the life of uh, recording YouTube videos. So I was going to show you how to do everything live, but the problem I have now is that I've done a bunch of this stuff and I can't, I can't do it for the first time again. But that's okay, because since I recorded this video, a bunch of things have happened. So I thought I could take you through kind of the next step of what, what needs to happen. Okay, so here's the first, the first thing I saw when I landed on this issue. So the issue comes up and it says, um, this code here has been... Uh, is using a deprecated API. So deprecated APIs are um, parts of an API that they want to remove, but they can't just remove it because if they remove an API, it's going to break everybody's code. So they don't want to break everyone's code by just changing randomly changing an API from one version to the next. So what they do is they have this transition period where an API still works, but whenever you use it, you get uh, a warning. You get a deprecation warning and they have lots of time for people to change their code. So they might do that for a number of releases. So it says, you know, we're using a deprecated API here and we shouldn't be, and there's a link. So if you go and you look at the link, um, this is the Node.js documentation that I'm in here. So the Node.js HTTP module is what I'm looking at here. And we're specifically looking at HTTP request.connection. So you can see that in here, it's been deprecated since version 13 of Node. And it was added in version 0.3.0. 0. 
So if somebody's running on version 10 of Node or 11 or 12, it's still supported, but going forward from 13, eventually they are gonna wanna get rid of it. And so they are preparing to be able to remove that. And the code in question in Fastify uses the Node.js HTTP module and they need to be able to um, you know, get ready for this deprecation that's coming. So request.connection returns, um, it gives access to um, this duplex stream object and it says that we should be instead using request.socket and it says see request.socket. So if you go to request.socket, you can see that it also returns the same type and it looks like um, request.socket was added in version 0.3.0. So it looks like what they've probably done is they've decided we have connection and we have socket and we don't need both. So we're gonna get rid of connection and we want everybody to start using socket instead. And you can see down here in this example code, they used the socket to get information like the port or the address or different pieces of information like this. So, <clears throat> excuse me, this bug is about making a change from, on the surface, making a change from um, working with the connection to working with a socket. Okay, so let me talk to you about how you would work on a project like Fastify. So something that you're gonna notice that's different about Fastify from the last project that we worked on is that when you have more people contributing, like 209, 294 people contributing to this and you have like almost 10,000 other projects on GitHub that are using it, probably many, many more. Like if we go to, um, NPM and I look up Fastify. Uh, here's Fastify. Yeah, like you can see it's getting um, 161,000 downloads uh, a week. So lots and lots of projects are using it and you can see um, different projects that are depending upon it. If you click on, uh, is it gonna show me? Uh, you used to be able to get this list. Oh, maybe, oh, sorry, here it is, it's down here. So you can see all different projects that are making use of it. Um, so that's, you know, there's lots and lots of different people making use of this, of this project. So it's a growing project. And when you have a project like this, it's really common for you to encounter a lot of tests. So we're gonna talk about tests extensively in this course because tests are a way for you to guarantee that people don't break things in a code base. If I write a piece of code and you come along and change that code two weeks later, well, all of a sudden all my work is undone, except if we write tests. And so this project has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tests to test all different aspects of how the code should work. So when you come into a bigger size project like this, it's very common for you to need to figure out how to run the tests. And usually there's gonna be documentation on this. Some systems, because this is a JavaScript project, it's a node project, it's very common for those types of things to happen inside of package.json. Package .json. And typically there will be a test script. Now, depending on the language you're using, depending on the environment you're using, you're gonna to have to figure out how do I install the dependencies? How do I run the tests? Well. In a node system, what you're gonna to have to do to install in dependencies is you're gonna to have to do npm install to install all the dependencies, and then you're gonna to have to do npm test. So sometimes this won't be documented, and it's not documented because it's quote unquote common knowledge. So there's, a, there's sort of a bar to get involved in some of these projects. You have to know enough about the ecosystem of how a node project works, or how a Java project works, or a Python project works, you have to do a little bit of research to make sure you know how to do it. And if there's some special case, they'll often document it and say, this is how you do it. So in a project like Fastify, you could look in the readme. So the readme might have information for developers, um, but this readme is mostly geared toward people who wanna use Fastify, not people who wanna develop Fastify. So there's nothing in here really about 
uh, like there's lots of docs, but not really any docs on how to develop it. Um, where to get support, who the people are, um, on and on and on. I do see that it's licensed under the MIT license, which is neat because again, this is the second project we've run into this week that is using MIT. And you can see that it's copyright to the Fastify team. And I have all the same kinds of permissions we've talked about before. I can use it, copy it, modify, merge it, publish it, and so on. And all I have to do is I have to keep this copyright notice and the permissions um, notice. And I have to accept the fact that this software is provided as is. So if there are bugs or there are problems in it, I'm taking on the risks of using those things. So this is neat that we're seeing another MIT licensed project in um, in a week where we're where we're talking about the MIT license. Okay, so how would I go about running the test for this thing? So if you're going to start making any changes to a project like this, you would first begin by uh, step one. You need a branch. So I am going to be working on this issue, issue number two five seven five. And so what I've done here is git checkout dash b issue 2575. Now I have already done this. I'm already sitting on a branch called issue 2575 because as I said, I did this yesterday when my video crashed. But I would suggest to you that you name your branch using the name of the issue that you're fixing so that if you're trying to go back in time and find your code, you, you know you were working on issue 2575, you have an issue 2575 branch, they go together. So once you have your branch, the next thing that you would do is you would install all of your dependencies. And I have already, I have already installed the dependencies on this project. I already have a node modules folder, but if I were to type npm install, it would go through and it would install all of those dependencies in the project. Okay, the last thing that you should do before you start making any changes to the code is you should run the tests. Make sure that you can get this code to run on your machine, that the tests are working on your local computer, and that you are passing all of the tests. What I don't wanna do, so I'm gonna start the test and then I'll keep talking. NPM test is how I would run these tests. So the package.json file, has a test script and I'm going to run the test script here. So npm test. Uh, I want to know that the tests pass before I start playing around with the code because if they don't, if they don't work, let me, sorry, I'm going to flip this over. Here's the test script right here that I was just talking about a second ago. If the tests don't work, I need to uh, know that now so that I know that I didn't cause a failure. So I'm interested to make sure that everything in here works the way that it would I would expect it to. It's very common for a project the size of Fastify that the tests will always pass. You won't see them accepting people's code or making changes to the code that break the tests because if you break the tests, it's impossible for other people to keep working on the code because the tests don't work. And if the tests don't work, then what people are gonna do is they're gonna ignore the tests. And if they ignore the tests, then we might as well not have tests. So just the same if, if you and I were sharing a kitchen and I go in and I cook a meal and I leave all my dishes out and I leave a huge mess, it's not possible for you to cook. So these tests have to be passing. Everything has to be clean and ready to go so that the next person who wants to do any development, they can, they can jump in and do this. So you can see thousands of, of assertions going by here. It's running, like looks like it's running four different tests in parallel. Each one of these tests has all different assertions in it. So assertions being, um, this has to be true, this has to be true, calling this function returns this result, etc. 4,000. So far, everything's passing. Okay, so this all works. Everything passed. And then it also prints out this nice uh, table for me at the end. This is called uh, code coverage information. So what you can see here is it, it has a list of all different files that were, that were tests, like source files. And it tells you in here if any of the lines of code were untouched during the tests. So for example, in this file, line 52 never got hit. That's potentially a problem. So you can see that only 96 percent of the branches within the code were touched, 97% of the functions. 
you really want to have these numbers as high as possible. It's not always possible to hit 100. Sometimes it's tricky. So you can see here there's a branch that's missing. Maybe there's an if statement where we do one way, but we don't do the other way. We'll talk about that in a later test, later class. Okay, so I know the tests all pass, which is great. So now what I could do is I could try and fix this bug. So the bug is change this line of code in librequest.js. So I'm gonna go over here and look for request, librequest.js. And I wanna to go to line 119, which is here. And it says, we shouldn't be using connection we should be using socket. So I'm just gonna try changing this to socket. And um, notice how I would normally put a semicolon in my code, but when I put a semicolon here, it gives me an error, extra semicolon. So whenever you're in somebody else's code, you wanna make sure that you adhere to the rules of their code. In the Fastify project, they don't want semicolons. Therefore, I'm not gonna put a semicolon, even though that's my preference. My preference does not matter when I'm inside somebody else's project. So it's good to get yourself into the habit of looking at all of the rest of the code around you. How do they write it? So for example, you'll notice they don't have a lot of extra space above and below it. So if I were to put in a bunch of extra space, you can see it's complaining. It's saying, um, I've got more than one blank line is not allowed. So they have a lot of rules about how their code should look. They want every piece of code to look the same so it looks like the same person wrote it. Okay, so we do this, we make this change. Let's try rerunning the tests and see how it goes. So on the surface, this is labeled good first issue, meaning the project team feels that this would be a good issue for someone who wants to get started in the project. It looks like it should be a simple change. All we need to do is change over to use request.socket instead of request.connection. So we do that and we make this change and already you can see I've got failures. So here's a failure, cannot read remote address of undefined. And you can see that it is failing test log debug inside lib request on line 126. Line 126 is right here. You can see it failed here, it failed here. So something is broken. So it looks to me like what's happening is they're trying to read the IP address and the IP address is reaching up to this dot connection. This dot connection is right here and it's trying to get whatever the return value of, of this is, i.e. the socket and then pull off the remote address from the socket. And for some reason, um, the socket is undefined whenever this happens. So right now we're failing, wow, how many, how many tests? So look at this, we're failing nine separate assertions in four different files. So we made a one line change and already we've broken everything. And you can see, look at this, now we've got like our coverage looks different, a whole bunch of things broke. So this is weird, I need to understand this. But the thing is, I don't understand this code. So I need to do a little bit of experimenting. So I don't understand why the socket is not there. It's supposed to be there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw a console log in here and I'm just gonna print out this dot raw and I wanna see what this dot raw is. So raw is equal to, yeah, okay. So it looks to me like they have their own request and they're making their own request type and the request type takes in a, a node HTTP request object and it stores it on the raw parameter. So when I say this dot raw, I'm actually saying this dot request down here. So socket. So I'm gonna print out this dot raw and see what the heck's going on when this fails. Rerun the tests. Okay, so now I'm getting a whole bunch more information. So you can see I'm failing the same test. Uh, remote address of undefined cannot be read. But if I scroll up, you can see the request. So here's the request right here. 
So what does the request have? It has um, readable state, which I don't care about. It has readable, it has events, events count, max listeners. It has a URL, HTTP version, a method. It has a set of headers and it's using localhost 80 and something called light my request as the user agent. Um, and then it has this thing, it has connection, remote address 127001. So this is interesting because um, the code used to say uh, connection like that, and it worked. And you can see that this code here has a connection, but when I put in a socket, um, it breaks. So one theory we could try is maybe what I need to do is I need to say this.socket or this.raw.connection. I could do that, for example. And that would probably pass the test. But what I don't know is, I don't know if that's the right fix. So sometimes when you're dealing with code like this, the problem isn't a programming problem because I could make this test pass, but I don't know if that's the fix that they want, if that's the right fix. So let's go down and see if we ever do get a socket. So this one fails and there's no socket. Um, but this one passes. Look at this, so this one has a socket. So that's interesting. So this one has a socket and the socket has tons of information on it. Look at all that. And here's another one. It has a socket. Okay, so what this means to me is that not every case, not every test is missing this socket. It's only some of them that are missing the socket. All of these, like, look at them all. So most of them have a socket. Like these are all passing and they all have the socket property on them. So that's really interesting. So the ones that are failing, if we go back up and look through the failing tests, what is the same about these? So the first one that fails, localhost 80, 127.001, light my request. Second one that fails, Again, localhost 80 URL is the root. Um, connection remote address 127.001, light my request. This one fails, same thing again. So all of these failing tests look the same. Like when they fail, they fail exactly the same. So my gut instinct is that this probably means that these failures are like fake test data, rather than being real requests, something is probably simulating this. And I don't know what this is, light my request. So let's do a search. So I'm gonna search in here for light my request. And it comes up a few times and I can see that right here, they're importing it. They import light my request from light my request. So that must mean light my request looks like the name of a module, light my request. Here it is right here inside of the package.json. So this is actually another module um, that's being used. So if we go to npmjs.com and we do a search for light my request, there is a repo here and it's actually owned by the same project, Fastify, so that's interesting. And it says that light my request is used to inject a fake HTTP request or response into a node server for simulating server logic or writing tests. So this has gotta be what this is. So it sounds to me like this is a problem inside here. So let's go and take a look at this code. Um, so if we go and look at the light my request repository, what I would love to do is I'd love to see where connection is defined in here. Because something, if you notice, look at these tests. In every one of these cases, the connection is there and it has a remote address of 127.0.0.1. So if you look for connection in here, inside of the code, there are five instances in the code where it happens. So it happens in response. It happens in this test file. It happens in this test file. And it also happens in this lib request.js. And this 
This is very interesting. This is exactly what we're seeing. So if I click here, you can see that um, they're defining a request and they're putting a bunch of stuff on the request, a URL, an HTTP version, a method, headers, all this stuff. And then they also define the connection and the connection is going to automatically get 127.001 unless a remote address is passed on the options object. So this is really interesting. Okay, so at this point, I have done enough research that I think I sort of understand what's going on here, but I literally have no idea what the right way to fix it is because it seems to me like the problem is probably in some other module, like um, all of these tests. Let's go back and look at these tests that are failing. So this 404 test, for example, if I look up 404, if I look at this test, the test that is failing is inside log, log debug. So if we go here, actually it's right here. So log debug is right here and you can see it's doing inject, it's injecting this information. So this is probably what we're dealing with right here. It's injecting the response into the server and then it's doing a bunch of checks to make sure that everything works the way that it's supposed to. So I think this is the problem. Okay, so what do you do at this point? You know, you've gotten to a point where you've done enough research that you think you know what the problem is, but you don't know what the answer is. So at that point, what I do is I go to the community. So I went and I, I left a message on the bug and I say, okay, I'm working on this bug. I thought I would try it. And I tried changing socket over, um, tried changing connection over to socket. But when I do this, I'm failing nine different tests and I show all the tests that I'm failing. And then I put information in to show, okay, when it fails, this is how they all seem to fail. They all fail because the remote address can't be found. And then I also give information and I show, okay, this, this here is an example of what all the requests look like. So I put that in the issue too. I say, this is what it looks like when things happen and i also i also put in information in and i said you know i noticed that inside of light my request there's this block of code that looks like it might be related but i'm not sure what to do next can somebody give me a hand what should i do is this you know what's the answer so the maintainer of the project comes back and says yeah it look it's a test only problem and i think you need a fix inside of light my request so that's really helpful. I now have some direction from one of the developers. I need to go and fix this in another project. So I do a little bit more research and I notice that in the light my request um, repo, there's a number of issues. And one of the issues that's in here is that this library is missing socket. It's missing socket. So this issue was filed in April and another developer needs to have socket, just like I need to have socket. And so he filed an issue to say, we need socket, it's not there. So what I did is I left a message on this issue saying, I need this too, I also need this, and I'm working on this other issue in another repository. And when I do this, it fails. And I tried to just change this, but that doesn't seem to work. Um, and I'm not sure what the right answer is. So again, the same developer shows up and says to me, what you need to do is you need to put this code right after the code you were working on. And if you do that, it will work. And I say, thanks, that's great. I'll send you a PR. Okay, so then what I did is I forked this repository and I have the code for the other repository here. So this is the light my request repository that I have on my machine. And I made a fix to the code like this. So what they said in the bug is they said, um, what you need to do is you need to add this line of code right to the end of the block where I was seeing this other connection being defined. So essentially what they want me to do is they want me to define connection and they also want me to define socket. And I made a branch and I pushed up a pull request. So here's my pull request. 
My pull request fixes number 87. So do you notice, let me just show you what this, like this style is really important when you're fixing bugs in GitHub. I am submitting a fix for issue number 87. So when I do that, what I wanna do is I wanna mention that this fixes number 87 so that GitHub will automatically link those two things together. The pull request and the issue will get linked together. I explain what I'm doing like this, and I, I submitted my code like so. My code is just a one line change like this. So overnight, since I did that, you can see how many people have responded to me. So I've got five different people who've already done a review on this. A lot of people care about this code. So the very first response that I get is, can you please add a test case? So I need to fix that. The next response that I got, it said that we're gonna need to have some kind of deprecation here. So because Node is deprecating this, they want to also follow the same deprecation style. And then there's a discussion about the best way to do this. So one of the developers says, I think you can do this in TypeScript by adding a deprecated um, comment above this. So we could try that. And another developer says, I think you should do it this way. So since connection has been deprecated in favor of socket, I think we should do something like this. So instead of doing what I did here, they want me to write code that looks like this. So that's interesting. And you can see that um, there's a plus one on this, meaning, yeah, that's a good solution. Why don't you do it that way? Okay, so I wanted to pick up from here because this is a perfect time for me to show you what happens when you get feedback on a bug. So right now I pushed up one commit, uh, one commit to add the missing request.socket. So this was, this was my change. My change is a one line change, but I've got a whole bunch of feedback. I need to write a test and I need to update my, update my code. So what I'm gonna do is I am currently working on the, you'll see right here, this is the, this is the issue 87 branch. So what I wanna do is I wanna be on my issue 87 branch and you can see um, on, the, on my uh, issue 87 branch, I've got one commit, but I need to make changes and I need to add more to my pull request. So the way that I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna stay on this same, uh, same branch and I'm gonna make more changes. So let's do one, one thing at a time. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make these changes right here. So I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna copy and paste this to be honest with you because the code is exactly what, I'm gonna put this in here like this. And I'm gonna save that. Okay. And now I'm going to look into this um, deprecated thing. Now, I had never heard about this. So this is the kind of thing that happens when you're working on an open source project. You'll see that people will, they'll tell you about new things that are happening in a language. So TypeScript has added this deprecated uh, decorator. And so now you can put a comment above some property and Visual Studio Code and the type system will tell you, oh, this has been deprecate, deprecated. So let's try using it. So according to, according to this comment, he's saying I should be able to do it in the typings. So he's saying if you do this inside of light my request index.ts, index.d.ts index line 63. So index.d.ts is right here and line 63 is right here and He's saying that we should be able to mention that connection has been, um, let's try this. So let's see. Connection object. So we define a type and we say, we'll do it this way. Now I notice he's doing comments like this. He or she, I don't actually know, so I should be careful, they. Uh, here, let's change this to match the style 
like so. I'm gonna save this. So I've made those two changes. And let's just run, I'm gonna run the tests as they are right now to see if that breaks anything. Uh, it doesn't like what I've done. So trailing spaces are not allowed. So request.js line 70, there's a trailing space right here. So I'm gonna get rid of that. And on 77, there's a trailing space. Um, let's see if that fixes it. <laughs> okay, so I failed 85 tests. Uh, cannot redefine property connection. Okay, so I am redefining, cannot redefine property connection. I wonder if it's because of this. Cannot redefine property connection. So that's not it. So what am I doing wrong? Uh, socket. Where is it defining connection? There. And it's only in the request. Cannot, cannot redefine property connection. Hmm. I think that what has to happen here, um, I need to, I think I need to make this configurable. So object.define property uh, takes a property name and configurable. with, yeah. I think if I say configurable true, that might be enough. Okay, so let's see. So can't read remote address of undefined. This is in test, uh, test.js and passes remote address. So passes uh, remote address. So it's using request.connection.remote address. If I change this to socket, okay, only one failing test. Same thing, uh, this is in passes localhost. Passes localhost as um, default remote address here, socket, and 
I'm just interested to see if they ever define connection on the request. Request.connection. That's response. So I guess it would be request.connection. So it's never defined in there. So if I pm test. Okay, so lines 74 and 129 are not being tested. So 70, uh, it's not being, not being tested on request, get return this dot socket. Okay, so we need to get a test that includes this um, connection. So let's let's do that. So I need to look at the tests and um, passes remote address. So let's just copy this test and do something similar. So here I'm going to say um, includes a connection. So what we want here, it should have connection as well. So connection should exist. And this, I think, is going to fail. More than one blank line not allowed on line 11 to here. Okay, save this, try again. So this fails, cannot read remote address of undefined. So let's see here. Likely the problem is the scoping of this. Uh, return this dot socket. So instead of doing this on request, object dot define. So let me go back and read his comment. So I think, just took a, a pause for a second to take a look, quick look at this. And I think what I need to do here is not put this property on the request constructor, but put it on this object. Um, let's try that. Okay, that is passing the tests. Okay, so let's take a look at this point. Let's take a look at all the changes that we've made. So, um, we've added the deprecation decorator to the types. We've changed connection to socket. We've defined a new property here to return the socket. And we've added a new test to make sure that, um, uh, sorry, we've, the way that Git is showing this is funny, but what's happened here is we've changed from connection to socket. And um, includes deprecated connection. Oh, wait a second. I need to make sure I didn't mess this up includes deprecated remote address and this is socket 
Passes remote address. Yes. Okay. So socket and this is connection includes deprecated connection dot remote address um, Yeah, so the way that it's showing it in the diff, but you can see in, uh, when you look at it in Visual Studio Code, you can see that this line has been added. So socket remote address, and it's just pushed this connection line down, which is why it looks funny. So this is down here under this new, new style like that. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna make sure that I've um, done what they asked. So they wanted a test and they wanted me to do the typing and the define the property. So I'm gonna I'm gonna add to my current pull request number 87. Currently it only has one commit. I'm about to put another one on there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add um, index.d.ts, lib, request.js, and test, test.js. So those three have been staged, and I'm going to commit a, a second time, and I'm going to say um, add a test, update, typing, typings, um, update the typing, and, um, and, Add a um, add a connection property. Okay, so that went in. I now have a second. Um, a second commit here that I'll push up and I'll see what they what they say. So I'm gonna say git push origin issue 87, like so. And when I do that, over here we'll see it appear. So I'm gonna push it up. And you should see down here that this will, all of a sudden a new one appears, right? Inside my pull request. And I now have two commits. Let me refresh this two commits instead of one, and I now have three files changed like so. And I'm gonna go and I'm gonna update the issue and um, add some more information. So what I'll do here is I will say, um, in fact, I'll do it, instead of in this conversation here, I'll do it down below, I'll say thanks for all the feedback. I've tried to um, make the changes, updates that were requested. Let me know if um, I've done it, I've done it incorrectly or there are other things I should consider. And I'll leave my comment like so. And we'll see what they say. So this process will go on for another few rounds. My guess is that I'm gonna hear back from them and they're gonna tell me that what I've done is wrong, I need to change these two things, or I misinterpreted what they said, or whatever will happen. And eventually once this gets fixed, I'll be able to go back and fix the original issue that I was trying to fix over in this other repo. So the reason I wanted to show you this one is because sometimes when you see good first issue, 
Good first issue doesn't mean easy. It doesn't mean this will take you five seconds. Sometimes it does, but sometimes it means this is a good starting place, but you're gonna have to do a bunch of work to make this happen. You're gonna have to write tests. You're gonna have to go work in other repositories. You're gonna have to interact with all sorts of people. So over here, I've, you know, I've been interacting with lots and lots of people, like five different people have already talked to me about this, um, this like one line change, but a one line change turns into a two repository change, turns into a, like all kinds of adding tests and adding all sorts of things. Anyway, it's all lots of fun and it's a huge learning process. And as you do it, you get more and more experience and you learn more about how this stuff works. So I'll pause it there and we'll see what happens. You can follow along in these pull requests and see, um, see what they say to me as, um, as the days go by.